Hi, I'm Brian Dickinson, and this training bite is on class constraints in System Verilog. So this is the eighth and final training bite in a series showing you how to use classes in System Verilog, and in this bite we're looking at defining constraints for the randomization of class properties. So a constraint allows you to restrict the values generated by randomization. In my class rand class, I have a constraint called c1 that says that p1 is not allowed to be equal to zero. Let's have a closer look at the syntax for this. So we have the keyword constraint, followed by the name of the constraint, this is c1, then open curly brackets, and then a list of constraint items, each of which are terminated with a semicolon. I've only got one here, and then I have a close curly brackets which terminates the constraint block, and then I'm not allowed to have a semicolon after the end of the constraint line. So this is a major inconsistency in syntax for System Verilog. And most compilers will actually let you get away with putting a semicolon at the end of the line. They will give you a warning, but they will not give you an error, because this is so different from normal System Verilog code. So now I can create an instance, my rand of rand class. I can call a randomize method of my rand, and I'll be randomizing p1 with the applied constraint that it can't be equal to zero. So constraint items, these are normal class members and in inheritance, they're treated just like any other class member. So here in my base class, rand class, I have a constraint with a name not zero that says that p1 cannot be equal to zero. In my first subclass, rcx1, I have a constraint with the name not three that says that p1 cannot be equal to three. And this will be layered on top of the not zero constraint. So for instances of rcx1, I have not zero and not three constraints being applied. Now in RCX2, my second subclass, I am redefining the constraint not zero from the base class. So I'm overwriting it by redeclaring it with the same name. Now this is probably not a good idea in this case because the name now of the constraint not zero is inconsistent with the actual operation which says that P1 cannot be equal to one. So a better thing would be to do something like in RCX3 here, where you remove the constraint not zero first by redefining it with empty brackets, that removes the constraint, and then you define a new constraint, not one, with a name which is consistent with the operation of the constraint that says that P1 cannot be equal to one. And now when I create an instance here, my rand of RCX1 and randomize it, I'm randomizing it with both the not three constraint from RCX1 and the not zero constraint inherited from rand class, which means that P1 can be either equal to one or two. So let's have a look at a couple of different constraints over the next few slides. So inside constraints are particularly useful when you want to build up a list of values that a property can be randomized within. So here I have the inside constraint on P3 that says that P3 is restricted to the following list of values, 3, 7, and any value in the range 11 to 20. Now watch out for the syntax for this. So let's take break this down. So I have a constraint, C1, open curly brackets, opens my constraint block. I then have the constraint P3 inside. Another open curly brackets opens up the list of items for the inside operator. The individual items are separated by commas. I then have a close curly brackets to finish the inside list, a semicolon to terminate the inside constraint, and finally a close curly brackets to terminate the constraint block. You'll need an editor with a bracket matching facility if possible. You can also invert any constraint, and this is particularly useful with inside constraints because this allows you to basically specify a list of values that a value cannot take. You can define an outside constraint. So be careful with the syntax here. We are enclosing the inside constraint in curved brackets, and then we're using an inversion in front of that to say that we are inverting this constraint, and P3 has to take a value outside of the list of values 1, 7, and 10 to 255. 
So you can change the distribution of values inside of a list by using a variant on inside called dis, and this allows you to define individual weights or probabilities for the values in the list. The default weight for any value is 1. So here we're specifying that values in the range 0 to 127 have a weight of 2, but values in the range 128 to 255 have a weight of 1, so this makes the values in the range 0 to 127 twice as likely as values in the range 128 to 255. Now there's two ways of assigning weights inside of a dist constraint. The first one colon equals assigns the weight to an individual item or every single value in a range. The second form, colon slash, this assigns the weight to the item or it assigns it to the range as a whole. It divides up the weight amongst all the values in the range. So in my constraint C3 here, I have 7, which has an individual weight of 5. All the values in the range 11 to 20 have an individual weight of 3, but all the values in the range 26 to 30 share an overall weight of 1, which gives them an individual weight of 1 fifth. So fractional weights are possible, although it makes the values very unlikely. Negative weights are not possible, though. Now you can define conditional constraints also, where the constraints are dependent upon the value of a property of the class. So there's two ways of doing this. The first form uses an implication operator, which is the dash greater than symbol, and this allows us to say in this example if mode is equal to 1, the constraint on P3 is it's less than 100, but if mode equals 0, the constraint is P3 is greater than 10,000. The other form uses an if-else statement, although the else part is optional, and this pretty much does the same thing. Now you can control constraints using something called a constraint mode. So every constraint block has a built-in switch called constraint mode. This is turned on by default. If you disable it by setting it to zero, then the constraint is disabled for randomization. So you can write to the switch by using the task constraint mode. And you can read the value of a switch by using the function constraint mode. Now only constraint blocks have a constraint mode switch. You can't use these functions with any other class member. So let's show you an example of constraint mode. So here I have my RAND class with two constraints, blue and green. I create an instance of the RAND class in the handle myRAND, and the first thing I do here is call a constraint mode task directly off the myRAND instance, passing a value 0, and this disables all the constraints for myRAND. I can apply the constraint mode task to individual constraints, so here I call it off the blue constraint of myRAND, and I set the value of 1 for the switch for blue, which re-enables the blue constraint. I can test the value of the constraint mode switch, so here I use the function form of constraint mode to read the value of the green constraint mode switch, and this will return a zero because it's currently turned off. And now when I randomize the handle my rand, green constraint is disabled, so I'm randomizing without the green constraint, so the permissible values for P1 are 1, 2, or 3. So this is the final bite in this series looking at system Verilog classes. I hope you found them useful.